Dear friends, dear Muslims, let us now discuss the second half of our topic. What do you know about Islam? Not what you have heard about Islam, especially not recently. Not what you have heard from Mr. Bush or Mr. Blair or Mr. Darwin or Mr. Einstein or Mr. Disney or Mr. Spielberg. Not what you've heard from the New York Times or the London Times or NBC or CNN. No. What do you really know about Islam as a fact? Because the word Islam is not a uh, abstract terminology. It's not nebulous. It's not something that could be looked at from different perspectives and thought to be something different from different people's views. No, it's not like that. Not what your father said. Certainly, there's a difference between a man and a father. There's something different, obviously, between a male and a man. Now, I don't mean male man like the one that delivers the mail, but there's a difference between a M-A-L-E and a man. At least it used to be a clear distinction. A male is gender, born with that gender. Now they might choose from their own volition and want for themselves a different gender and pay a lot of money to do that or to fool you. <laughs> but male is a gender and female is a gender, but a man, this is a title of responsibility. That's different. So a male that does not fulfill the responsibilities of man is not completing the mandate of birth and God. They're just a male. And the same is for a female. Because the male and the female, they have different anatomies. They have different psychologies. They have different roles. Now there are others who will tell you that that is not so. They will say that women are equal to men in all respects, and they are competing, climbing up poles and digging ditches and everything. <laughs> but no men have opted to try to have children. <laughs> it's the same as Islam. Islam is a principle. Islam is a comprehensive system. Islam is a law. You may call it a religion. I don't like to use that word. It's too restricting. When we say religion, a whole lot of things just come up in the mind from all the movies and books and things that we've read, religion. Seems like kind of restriction, like a suit you might wear like going into some place like, like it might be to some people, virtual reality. You've heard of that, right? So like virtual reality, you can pay for, you can go somewhere and develop and have your own religion. But Islam is not like that. No, it's not like that. Islam is a law. Islam is a system. Islam is a legislation. Islam is a regulation, and therefore it has dimensions by which you can determine and identify it. Now a Muslim is an individual who makes the profession that they belong to or they are attached to that system. Do you judge a system by the people who say that they are a part of it? No, you don't. And that's why they have what they call disclosures. So that if somebody works for my company and they do something wrong, my company will not be liable. Is that correct? 
because I've already made a disclosure that this person does not necessarily represent our company in policy or so forth and so on. I've made a disclosure of that. Well, God has also made a disclosure that the human beings themselves, God is not indicted and God is not imperfect and God does not die and God does not have the limitations and God doesn't make mistakes and God is not immoral and God is not prejudiced. But some Muslims are. So we don't judge or indict a system of life by the people who claim to be that. We would not indict Jesus Christ by what Jim Jones did some years ago. We would not indict Jesus Christ by what Jeffrey Dahmer did. We would not indict Jesus Christ by what Charles Manson did. We would not indict Jesus Christ by the Oklahoma bomber, what was his name? <laughs> Timothy McVeigh. Was he a fun Christian fundamentalist? We would not indict him. We would not call any of those people Christian fanatics, Christian terrorists. We would not say that the IRA in, in uh, Ireland, that they are Christian fanatics. We don't say that. So how do we say Muslim fanatics? Islamic fundamentalists, Islamic terrorists. How do we indict a global faith of more than 1,500 years with a legislation, with principles, with dignity, with a record? How do we indict that entire faith and all the people who's with that faith and put them in some kind of classification and put on them an oxymoron? You know what that is, don't you? An oxymoron is a word that means just the opposite of what you put next to it. Islamic terrorist, Islamic fanatic, those are oxymorons. A person cannot be Islamic by, by definition if they are fanatic. They cannot be. Because Islam is a system of peace, a system of submission and surrender to God, a system of dignity. Now, if somebody who's a Muslim doesn't act that way, if a Muslim acts as a criminal way, what are they? They're a Muslim criminal, is that correct? If a Christian doesn't act the way Jesus Christ spoke, how he lived and his message, if a Christian commits a crime, what are they? A Christian criminal. A Jewish person commits a crime, what are they? A Jewish criminal. A Buddhist, a Hindu, or anyone else that commits a crime, they are what? Criminals, but you don't indict the faith because of the criminal, do you? If that were the case, America, Great Britain, France, Germany, all the so-called advanced nations, they got more criminals wearing suits than all the criminals that are in jail. They would all be criminal governments. Now we hear the terms Islam and Muslims quite often, and we read about Islam and Muslims in the periodicals, textbooks of colleges and universities. We hear and we see a lot of inaccurate, misleading, and purposeful misinformation through the media, and we have to admit that some of this misinformation, some of this misrepresentation, and some of this distortion has been perpetuated by Muslims themselves. We have to admit that. That is true to a certain extent. Yet, one out of every five people in this world is a Muslim. There are more than 1.4 billion Muslims in the world. We don't say 1.4 billion Arabs, Asians, Africans. We didn't say that because you cannot find any country in the world. And even if you discover a new country, there'll be some Muslims there. <laughs> White, black, green, yellow, tall, short, male, female, poor, rich, of every ethnicity. The Muslim nation, the Muslim brotherhood, it's a global brotherhood, a global nation, and Muslims are everywhere in the world. One out of every five people in this world is a Muslim. 
Just like one out of every five people in this world is a Chinese. And nearly one out of every five people in this world is from the Indian continent. These are statistics that we can support. Go to your computer, do a search. Go to the encyclopedia and do a search. Go to the almanac and do a search and you will verify this statistic. And you know everything about India and you know everything about China. But I ask you the question, why don't you know something about Islam? You know the language of China, you know the language of India, you know the constitution, everything can be found. People talk, you eat Chinese food, you eat Indian food. But I ask you, what do you really know about Islam? What do you know about the social, the economic, the political, the historical factors about Islam? Why don't you know about Islam? What is it that joins over 37 nations together into a brotherhood, a configuration, a common fraternity? What makes a brother in Saudi Arabia my brother and I'm from America? And what makes my brother from Pakistan my brother? And what makes an Australian my brother? A French Muslim, a German Muslim, a Scandinavian Muslim, an English Muslim, an Indonesian Muslim. What makes them my brother? We're not the same color. We don't have the same culture. We don't speak the same language. What makes us brothers is our bond of faith. It is Islam that makes us brothers. What are the accurate characteristics of this misunderstood way of life that is followed by the greater part of humanity? I'll try to provide you with some facts, but in addition to this, as I mentioned to you before, it is necessary for you to be open-minded and open-hearted. Otherwise, you're gonna miss what I tell you because you're gonna turn that glass upside down. The word Islam means surrender, submission, and obedience. Surrender, submission, and obedience to whom? The creator of the heavens and the earth. You can say Allah, or you can say the creator. You can say the source of creation. You can say the principle behind existence. You can say all those attributes belong to the creator. The all-wise, the all-knowing, the absolute, the eternal, the one upon whom all depends while the creator depends upon none. We say Allah, Allah, because in the Arabic language this is a very clear nomenclature. So you see, if I said God, if I spell it backwards, what is it? See? And that's why some people might even take a dog as God. I mean, after all, if a dog is a man's best friend, he could become his God. We say Allah. And this is not a God of the Muslims. Allah comes from the, the article. A-L meaning the, meaning only, meaning particular, meaning distinct, A-L, Al, and Allah means that which is worshipped, that which is adored, that which is obeyed, that which is inclined to, that which is submitted to. So when we say Allah, it means the only one worthy of worship, recognition, and praise. Allah. We say Allah because in the Arabic word, this means uniqueness and without gender. So from this point, I'm going to use the word Allah and you know that I'm not speaking of the Muslim God. I'm speaking of the creator of the heavens and earth, your Lord and my Lord. The same God of Moses and Abraham, 
and Jacob and the tribes and John the Baptist and Jesus Christ and the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, the same God. And none of them used the word God. In the Hebrew language or the Aramaic language or the Arabic language, the word Elah or Allah is the only word they ever used because it is a very clear, distinct name. It has never been used for any tangible thing, nor even an idea. The word Islam is derived from the word Salama. Salama means to be at peace. It also means safety. It also means security. Therefore, a Muslim is a person that surrenders to whom? Allah. A Muslim is a person that submits and obeys the law of whom? Allah, Almighty God. And through this submission obtains peace for themselves. You see, the formula is very simple. When I surrender to the law, when I conform to the law and the legislation which is intended for me, that means that is my natural disposition. Therefore, I become what? A conformist. I am in order, I am in harmony, and by being in order and harmony, the things I'm supposed to receive comes to me. So it's natural to be a Muslim, it's unnatural not to be. We can immediately see by that definition that all the prophets of Almighty God were what? Muslims. Because even Almighty God said in the revelation that we recited before from the surah which is called al bayna Fadlu Habibi. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Wa ma umiru illa liya'budu Allah illa liya'budu مخلصين له الدين حنفاء ويقيم الصلاة ويؤت الزكاة وذلك دين القيمة. This verse from the Quran says: "وما أمروا إلا ليعبد الله مخلصين له الدين حنفاء أو يقيم الصلاة ويؤت الزكاة وذلك دين القيمة." The verse is very clear, it says, and they, the human beings, the prophets of Almighty God, they were not ordered to do anything except to worship, to recognize, to obey their Lord, and to be mukhlis. Mukhlis means to be sincere towards God, to be clean, to be moral towards the legislation that he ordered them. What legislation did God order them? Every prophet that came to every people. He came with a book. He came with a message. He came with a behavior. He came pleading with the people, telling them, do not worship idols. Do not worship other deities. Do not be pagans. Don't associate partners with God. Do not disobey your creator. Do not ignore your creator. Be decent, be upright, be moral, be kind, be gentle. وَمَا أُمِنُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ مُخْلِسِينَ لَحُدِّينَ Hunafa. Hunafa. It means to be Hanif. Hanif means being straight with God. Not allowing any interference between you and God. No partners, no associates. Holding your relation with God sacred. And therefore, what God has ordered you to do, to put that order before every other order. This is called Hanifa. And to establish prayer. Because after all, what can we do for God? What can we do for the one that created us? What can we do? If your mother and father gave birth to you, taught you, all what your mother did for you while you were young, staying up at night while she suffered with you, through school, through college, and after you finish, 
They become old and you put them inside of an old age home, a retirement home. Shame on you. What can you do for your parents after they did all of that for you? What can you do for them? Nothing. Then what can we do for God? Nothing. Except to worship him. To acknowledge him. To conform to his law. Our yuqimu salah to establish the prayer in your lives and to be charitable. And God said, being decent towards God and being decent towards the human beings, this is the right way. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, if you read the scriptures carefully without your own interpretation or somebody else's, additional fabrication, you will find that this was the simple message of all the prophets who confirmed one another. Not one of these prophets ever said, I am God, worship me. Jesus Christ did not say, I am God, worship me. Now, if there's a Christian in this room that can tell me that Jesus said in his own words, not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke, not John, not Paul, but Jesus said, I am God, worship me then we will raise $5,000 for you tonight before you leave. Break your Bibles out. Call somebody up. Go make a phone call. Get the verse. You'll never find it. You'll find somebody else's word alluding to that. You'll find somebody else's reference appearing that. But Jesus never said to anybody, I am God, worship me. He said, my father, he didn't say my father who art in heaven because he was not exclusively the servant of God. He said, when he taught them how to pray, I used to be a Christian. I still love Jesus Christ. I'm still connected to his message. I know it very well. He said, and you know that he said, our father, didn't he say that? He didn't mean our father in the sense that he gave birth to us, but he said, our Lord, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, not my name, not our name. Thy kingdom come, not my kingdom come, not our kingdom come. If he's part of the Trinity, if he's divine, if he's part of God or he's next to God, he will say, our kingdom come. He said, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Did he say that? Did he say that? So now if he said give us this day our daily bread, that means Jesus and his mother could not have been divine because if he said give us this day our daily bread, you and I, we eat and we drink. Jesus and his mother, they ate and they drank. And you know and I know that when you eat and drink, the body only uses some of it. The rest of it, the body evacuates. Now, can you imagine God defecating and urinating? Let's move on with the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who do what? trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, huh? but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Now, does this sound like God praying to you? Did you ever think about that? Now, that's the Lord's prayer. That's the evidence of that. Now, we know Jesus said that. That wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul. Jesus said that. Dear brothers and sisters and guests, go home tonight and palm through all the pages of your Bible, and I guarantee you will never find it once anywhere. So where did this come from? In three or four different occasions, it is mentioned in your scripture that I have read throughout my life before I became a Muslim that Jesus walked off and he fell down on his face and he worshiped God. Did he say that? Now, is that God bowing down to himself? Is that God calling on himself? 
No, Jesus said, I am Jesus who is sent, and the one who is sent is not like the one who sent me. Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing, but whatsoever the one orders me, the one who sent me tells me to do, that is what I do. We cannot take Jesus out of the context of what Jesus said himself and make Jesus what we want him to be. We can't make Jesus a man God because the Romans and the Greeks had men gods. Because Jesus said, take not my message unto the Greeks, the Romans, the Samaritans for my message and I was sent to whom? the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. Isn't that what Jesus said? So Paul was mistaken when he said, I became apostle to the Gentiles. Jesus said, don't take my message to them. Brothers and sisters, we can immediately see by such an example and definition that Jesus Christ himself submitted himself to God, that Moses and Abraham submitted themselves to God, that Isaac and Ismael submitted themselves to God, that John the Baptist submitted himself to God and submission means surrender and surrender means salama, salama. The one who does that is called Muslim. So what was Jesus? What was Abraham? What was Moses? What was David? Don't get confused about the Arabic word now. It only means one that surrenders. So say it in English or say it in Arabic. It means Muslim. Everyone is a Muslim, a child that has no volition of its own inside the womb of its mother is submitting to the natural disposition. What is it? Muslim. And can you tell me that a pure child that when it's born, it's already born with sins that it did not do? Now that doesn't even make sense. A child is born out of the womb and it inherits the sins of the world that Jesus already died for. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> now that's double, that's real double jeopardy. Double jeopardy for Jesus and double jeopardy for the child. I ask you, what was the Psalms of David? Did you ever read it real well? Did you ever read this, the Psalms of David? The Proverbs of Solomon? Did you ever listen and read what John the Baptist said, compare that to the gospel of Jesus? If you did and you also read the Quran, it will seem like you're reading the same words over and over. Why? Because they were all brothers and prophets, a one chain of prophets that were sent by Almighty God to the human beings, you and I. So when a child comes out of the womb of its mother, at that time that God has ordered it, what is it? A Muslim. When the sun goes around in its orbit, what is it? According to law, it's a Muslim. When the moon goes around the earth, what is it? By law, by decree, by definition, it is a Muslim. The law of gravity is a Muslim law. Everything that submits to Almighty God and follows what God has ordered it to do is what? A Muslim. All the prophets came speaking different languages to their respective people. And the only prophet that came to the entire world was the one that said that he came for the whole world. Jesus never said, I came for the whole world. He never said that. He said, I have been sent to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. He came to correct the corruptions and the excesses of the Bani Israel. And he came to announce what? The gospel. What does the gospel mean? What does the gospel mean? The good news. Good news of who? Good news of what? And Jesus Christ's mission and his prophethood was only two years and four months. Did you know that? His whole mission, his whole prophethood was only two years and four months because he came to announce that someone would come after him 
Someone that would hear from God and speak. Someone whose behavior would address all the problems of the world. Someone who would come with a book that would remain with you forever. Okay, what prophet came after Jesus Christ to fulfill that prophecy? And also, he would also confirm Jesus Christ and mention Jesus Christ. The Quran is the only book that came after Jesus Christ, that was revealed after Jesus Christ, that mentions the mother of Jesus Christ, that mentions the birth of Jesus Christ, that mentions the miracles of Jesus Christ. We are Muslims, we believe in the miraculous or the phenomenal birth of Jesus Christ. We believe it totally. God can do whatever he wants to do. And we believe that if God created the heavens and the earth by his command, if God says be, what is it? It is. And if God created Adam without a mother and father, Adam, our common father, had no mother and father, no parents. Adam was created by God. Adam was just a sperm drop mixed with mud. And God said be, and Adam became. And then God said, be, and Eve became. And from those two, all the human beings came. So who was the father and mother of Adam? Who was the father and mother of Eve? So at least Jesus had a mother. So what's more difficult for God, Adam and Eve or Jesus? We believe that Jesus' mother, Mary, she was never penetrated by any man to create Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was born without sperm. Because God can order any woman to be pregnant, and she'll be pregnant. Because before Mary, remember the story of Zachariah. Zachariah was 110, and his wife was 90. Do you remember that story? Zachariah, the prophet, who was the father of John, he was 110. His wife was 90. And he prayed to God for a son. He said, oh God, I have no children. God, give me a son. God answered him. The angel Gabriel came to him and said, you will have a son. He wanted to know how. I would want to know too. <laughs> he said, oh God, how will I have a son when I'm an old man? I don't have any water. And my wife is barren. She doesn't create no eggs in that language. She's barren. She's way beyond menopause. She's menopause. <laughs> but God said, so be it. When God orders a thing, it will be. And when Zachariah, a prophet of God, went back to his wife and said, guess what? I had a vision and God said to me through the angel that you will become pregnant. Of course she laughed, I would too. <laughs> but just as she laughed, she found something moving in her stomach. And guess who was the child that was born that was John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus Christ. Because Zachariah was the cousin of Hannah. And Hannah was the woman that prayed to God for a son that she could give to the priest so that he could become a priest. And she prayed to God and God told her through the angel Gabriel again that she will have a son. No that she will have a child and she had that child but when the child was a girl she said oh God verily I have given birth but it's a woman it's a girl the angel said to her so be it this girl will be the chief of the women in the hereafter and that's what Mary is 
And when Mary was born, she was given over to the care of Zachariah, who was the chief priest of the temple. And Mary was put into a place where her own apartment. And when Zachariah, who was the only one with the key, used to go and check on her, he found every time he checked on her, she had food. And he used to ask her, Mary, where do you get this food from? Why? What was strange about the food? I'll tell you what was strange. In the winter, she had fruit. She had fruit from the summer. And in the summer, she had the fruit from the winter. Because she was selected by God. The prayer of Hannah. God answered her prayer by giving Hannah a girl who would give birth to the son that Hannah asked for. That's how God works. And while she was in that room, the angel Gabriel again came to her and said, Oh Mary, God announces to you a child that you will have whose son, I mean a son, whose name will be Esau. Esau. Jesus in the Spanish language or Jesus in the English language, but in Arabic, Esau. al Masih. And Masih means the anointed, the appointed, the Messiah, or the Christ. And Mary said to the angel, thinking that he was a man, if you fear Allah, don't come near me. Like any one of you women, any one of you decent women, if a man appeared to you in your bedroom, you would say, get out of here. Maybe you wouldn't say, if you fear God, you might pull for your gun or something. <laughs> but Mary said, if you fear God, don't come near me. The angel said, Mary, fear not. I'm a messenger from God to announce to you that you will have a son by the name of Esau. Peace and blessings be upon him. Mary said, how will I have a son when I've never been touched by any man and I'm not a woman that walks the streets? What is she saying? She's not a harlot. She was untouched. She's a virgin. She doesn't even mix with men. So how she will be pregnant? The angel said to her, so be it. When God orders a thing, he says to it, what? Be and it is. And just when the angel said that to her, Mary found herself just like the wife of Zachariah, pregnant, conceiving. And to make a long story short, when Jesus was born, Mary was ashamed because the people was already saying, she's a harlot, she's a this, she's a that. Look, she's pregnant. She had to go out, something had to happen. How did she get pregnant? She asked God, what should I say? God told her, don't say anything. Point to the child. The child will speak for himself and clear you of everything they say and Jesus did that that was his first miracle yes Jesus was born without a father that's the first phenomena secondly Jesus spoke from the cradle is that correct to clear his mother that was the first miracle Jesus Christ caused the deaf the deaf to hear caused the blind to see caused the lepers to be healed caused the dead to be raised up, blew into a clay pigeon, and caused it to fly off into life. Yes, Jesus, he fed more than 10,000 people from seven fish and seven loaves of bread. Jesus did that because God gave him the power to do that. When they asked him, how do you do such things? What did Jesus say? I can of my own self do nothing. But whatever the one who sent me orders me, that is what I do. And when someone called him good master, touched his garment, he pulled his garment from her hands and said to her, what? Why dost thou call me good when there's none good except whom? The one that is in heaven. Jesus made it clear even to Pontius Pilate when the high priest wanted to indict him calling him the son of God, calling him the king of the Jews. Pontius Pilate said to him, what do you say about the crime that they accuse you of? What do you say about that? 
that you call yourself the son of God. Now that was an accusation that he was committing a blasphemy according to the Jewish law. He said, thou sayest I'm the son of God. And what did Pontius Pilate do? Pontius Pilate said, I wash my hands and I find no fault with this man. Isn't that what Pontius Pilate said? His response was that Jesus was not guilty of what they said because by what he said, he denied it. So if Jesus denied that, how can somebody else for all these years keep calling him something that he denied? I say all these things to you because we Muslims, we love Jesus Christ maybe more than those who call themselves Christians. After all, we know more about his birth, about his life, about his message, about his mother, about his grandmother. We know more about his miracles and they have been confirmed and detailed in the Quran in our form of worship and what we believe is exactly what Jesus believed. But Jesus never said, I'm God, worship me. And we don't worship Jesus Christ and we don't worship Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We say that Jesus Christ is the son of Mary. He is the Messiah. He is a word from God and a spirit that God put in the womb of Mary and that God put his words in Jesus Christ's mouth and God gave him the power to do the miracles. That's what we say. We say that Jesus Christ was a great prophet and a messenger of God and that he announced the coming of the comforter, that counselor who would make all things clear, who would bring a book that would stay with the world forever, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On the basis of that, I believe that if loving Jesus Christ, following his message, knowing about him, if that means being Christian, then I'm more Christian than most of the people who call themselves Christians. But Jesus didn't tell the people to call themselves Christians. And Moses didn't tell the people to call themselves Mosaians. And David didn't say call themselves Davidians. And Abraham didn't tell the people to call themselves Abrahamians. And Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, did not tell the people to call themselves Mohammedans. No, they said call yourselves after God. That means what? God conscious people, servants of God. That's what all of them were, and that's what we are. So we don't worship Jesus Christ, because he never said that I'm God, worship me. Every prophet and messenger of Almighty God brought the very same and fundamental message, worship Almighty God and be sincere towards him. If we can examine this message of each of those well-known prophets, we would conclude this fact. Where there is a conflict, it is a result of false assertions, fabrication, exaggeration, Blasphemy, paganism, idolatry by the alleged writers, historians, scholars, and individuals. For instance, let me point out something to you that may be a bit interesting to you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who were they? Matthew who? Mark who? Luke who? And John who? What were their last names? When did they write? Did they know Jesus Christ? Did they walk with Jesus Christ? Did they eat with Jesus Christ? Did they talk with Jesus Christ? Did they even meet Jesus Christ? The answer is no, 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 no. Conclusively. The earliest of them that wrote, wrote 40 years after Jesus Christ, so they never met him. The last of them wrote 80 years after Jesus Christ, never met him. The other thing is, all of them seem to have written the gospel according to, according to, according to, according to. Now, when you write a letter, do you sign it according to? According to is the third party. If Joanne or Jackie or Bobby or Johnny told me something and I wrote it, I would say according to Joanne, Jackie, Bobby or Ronnie, according to. But those four people would not write a letter and in front of it say, Jackie, according to Jackie, and not even write her last name. 
Because if Jackie wrote me a check and only said Jackie, I couldn't cash it. And if I was a policeman and I stopped Jackie on the road and she had a license that only said Jackie, she's going to jail. <laughs> Where in the world is a document with only one name of four different writers that did not meet the one whom they're writing about? Where is that accepted in the whole world? Nowhere except in the Bible. And the church fathers and the church writers and the Christian historians, they all agree that perhaps those four writers themselves were only pen names. Because a writer would not write his only, his first name according to. And there's a great amount of suspicion that the man called Paul, Saul of Tarsus, that because he wrote all the books from Acts all the way to the end of the New Testament, how many books is that? How many? 16, 15, 17, 19? All the books of Acts on, Colossians, Ephesians, Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, all of those books are written by whom? Paul, Saul of Tarsus, another man who never walked, who never talked, who never met, who never ate, who never prayed, who never knew Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? Now here we find four writers and another one between them that wrote all the New Testament books that never talked, never walked, never ate, never prayed, never met the man called Jesus Christ. Yet in their Words, the first mentioning of the Trinity came from where? From Jesus or from them? The first mentioning of Jesus being divine, a man God, came from whom? From them. The first mentioning that Jesus is the Son of God came from whom? From them. Jesus never said in his own words any such words, but it was the men who never met him who claimed to have written, who didn't know their last names. And Paul, by the way, before he had that vision on the road to Damascus that only he saw and only he heard, guess what his occupation was? Do you know? He was a bounty hunter, a hunter of Christians, hunting them down like animals, binding them and bringing them to where? To Rome so that they could be executed. Now if Hitler, after killing thousands of Jews, said that on the road to Berlin, he had a vision that he was named an apostle to the Jews and he wrote 20 books that all the Jews were supposed to follow, do you think they would be following that book? I don't understand how people just don't read history. This is not what Khalid said, so don't get angry with me. This is your own scripture, your own Bible scholars, the own church fathers, all of them agree that Paul never met Jesus, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John never met Jesus. By the way, they were not disciples nor were they walkers and talkers of the disciples. They were just writers and historians. My brothers and sisters and my respected guests, I have kept you here this evening and I appreciate your indulgence. And I promise you that I will keep you here only another 15 minutes. Will that be okay? I said these things concerning Jesus Christ because we want to clear Jesus Christ's name. We want to establish that we have a love and a respect for Jesus Christ. We have a love and a respect for the message of Jesus Christ. But we also want to make it clear that Jesus Christ's life, 
took us towards a certain direction. It pointed us in the world to a certain direction. It is our conviction that the life of Jesus Christ pointed us in the direction of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the purpose of life? Why is it that when we ask the simple question, what is the purpose of our lives? Why do we get so many different answers? It is because people haven't really thought about it. It's too frightening. Not the question itself is frightening, but what's frightening is that if we answer it clearly, it may change our lives indelibly, and we are afraid of change. And now we have discovered that every part of creation that has been discovered is inside of a drop of water. Well, the Quran already said that to us 1,500 years ago, that we created everything and every single thing from water. The Quran said that. We want to talk this evening about Jesus, the son of Mary, and his phenomenal birth. A birth that very few human beings, whether Muslims or Christians, have any argument about. We believe, and our Quran makes it clear for us and confirms for us that Jesus Christ, in fact, he was born without the intervention of sperm. That his mother, Mary, that blessed woman, she became pregnant by the word of God. No man touched her. Eight murders or homicides are committed every 19 minutes. And two rapes are committed every seven minutes. And there are three robberies every 59 seconds. There are 257,000 children that are legally or illegally aborted. That is 257,000 children are killed in the womb by license. 21 million children are born every year out of wedlock who do not know their mothers and fathers or who do not know whom they are fathered by. 2.8 million suicides every year of human beings who find no reason to live. With these kinds of social problems inside of their own boundaries, inside of their own governments, in their own institutions, how can they bring peace to the world? It doesn't make sense. O oh, Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds you and me that whatever good happens, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if something else happens, this is from our own hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has ordered you and I to enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. And when we cease to do that, we don't enjoin the right, we don't enjoin, uh, enjoin the, we don't enjoin the right, we don't forbid the wrong, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that he will visit us a calamity from himself. So that when the calamity happens, or you are punished and the musibah comes upon you and you call upon Allah, he will not answer. What do the Muslims of today expect? 
The character of the Muslim is the most important part of the Muslim. Not what he or she says, not only what he or she wears, not where they come from or who their mother or father is or grandfather, not the country they live in or for that matter if they live next to the Kaaba. This is not important at all. It is the character because the character is the actual fruit. And we can remember on the occasion when the Prophet wasallam invited his companions to make a sacrifice in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, he brought half of his wealth. And he considered this to have been a major sacrifice. And he was very proud of that. But when Abu Bakr radiallahu an came, Abu Bakr, he brought all of his wealth. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Abu Bakr what he had left for his family, what was the response of Abu Bakr radiallahu an? He said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu. Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was by the suggestion or the order of the Prophet وسلم, that Abu Bakr took back some of his wealth for his family. And this is why the Prophet وسلم, mentioned that there was no one from among the Muslims who displayed his loyalty to Allah and his messenger وسلم, similar to that of Abu Bakr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, yes, definitely. Who? Who is better? Who is more excellent than the one that calls towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not just calling, not just shouting, not just arguing. But they are acting upon what they are calling. They are setting a precedent for what they are calling too. They have established a behavior, a paradigm, an example to what they are calling to. And they openly say, announce, I am Muslim. Where oceans and rivers meet, does the ocean take over the river? It doesn't, although the ocean might be five times, six times, eight times, ten times larger than a river. And you know, if you took two bodies of water and you put a funnel in between them, what would happen? The larger body would absorb the smaller body, wouldn't they? But in the case of the ocean and the river, it doesn't happen because Allah said he put a bazaar. So they do not overcome each other. And one of our uh, Jacques Cousteau, who passed away now, he was a marine biologist. He was able to film under the ocean where the rivers meet the ocean and the river meets the ocean and the ocean meets the river and they go back. They meet and they go back. So therefore the rivers return back to itself and the ocean returns back to itself and they do not overcome each other. How did the prophet know that? Islam has five fundamental pillars the first of which is to bear witness that there is none to be worshipped except Almighty God, consistent with the first commandment given to Moses, consistent with the first commandment that Jesus Christ also said is the greatest of the commandments. Hear you, Israel, the Lord thy God is one, absolutely one, not the number one, not the number one that could be divided into one, two, three, not the number one that could be multiplied, but absolutely one, having no one besides, no other God besides. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul, and thou shalt not worship anyone except the Lord thy God, nor bow down to any graven images in the heavens or the earth or the sea below. Such said Moses, and such said, confirm Jesus Christ, and such said the Qur'an. 
This is what we bear witness, and this is the first pillar of Islam, and the most important. If war erupts in Iraq, more than 3,000 missiles will be rained upon Iraq in a course of six, six hours, and more than a half a million people will be killed. Can you tell me how the lives of a half a million people are equal to a leader, Saddam Hussein? If America was able to go into South America and pull out what was the guy's name? General uh, Noriega. Noriega. America was selling drugs with Noriega, but then Noriega flipped on them. So they went in and took this man from his country, brought him out, and put him in jail for life in their country. So why did they don't just go into Iraq and pull out Saddam? No, they need to go into Iraq. Why? Because you'll find that in a matter of six months after the war, the prices in the oil will go down. And as we speak right now, there are 27 mega companies, mega companies who are bidding for contracts for the reconstruction of Iraq. What does it have to do with Saddam Hussein and democracy? If a man had to get pregnant and have a baby, he would die. And then on top of that, if he had to look forward to taking care of that child for the next 10, 15, 20 years, and sometimes the mother, she's taking care of a grown child. Men who still live with their mothers, you couldn't do it. And still she's taking care of herself and she's taking care of her husband. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward those sisters and may Allah cover their faults. And may Allah cause the husbands and brothers and sons to appreciate them because they are the goodly trees that bear the goodly fruit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he made brotherhood very sacred. Very important. It's the whole basis of the Muslim society, brotherhood. And when there's no brotherhood, believe it, there is no substance among the Muslims. No substance. The first principle and characteristics of da'wah is that the da'i has to have knowledge. Not just ambition. Not just emotional drive and not just a reaction to some insult that somebody has said, and not just a feeling to want to give dawah because you know it's an obligation. All of those things are good, and it's all necessary. But without knowledge, what are you going to do? But always show your composure and your willingness to talk to anybody. Because why? You put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the very beginning. The Messenger of Allah said, Allah, he didn't have all the answers, but he put his trust upon Allah. Allah says to him, فَتَوَكَّلُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ القائد أعلى المسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضع من غير خوف One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, to lead Words, Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.